Congratulations on making it to another Monday. Remember, everything you hate about this day, including the day itself, are completely artificial and can be eliminated. On this week's docket, we're going to discuss the Trump administration's most recent humanitarian crisis, the latest attempt to completely destroy our safety net by the Confederates, the crisis in Venezuela, an attempt, still forthcoming, to create a real-life Wakanda, a few instances of state violence complicit in oppression. And finally, we'll hop on over to Science News to talk about how engineers have created a prosthetic capable of feeling pain. This is Social Justice Alchemy. So this past week, and more than that actually, for quite some time now, the Trump administration has been detaining and separating, tearing apart, tearing apart immigrant families in his attempt to be the worst person ever. Obviously, people have been talking about this quite a bit because it really doesn't look good to have weeping, traumatized children show up in the news. A lot of people have had their hot takes, including, you know, this isn't America, and other people responding to them saying, yaha, because yes, this is America. This is the United States. This is what we do. This is what we were founded on. Remember, Europeans discovered this continent a few tens of thousands of years after the Native Americans came here. And once Europeans realized that there were natural resources in abundance, well, they immediately started committing genocide. And that's how we got the United States. Hundreds of years of genocide. In order to secure a land full of just abundant natural resources on which we built, using slavery, an incredibly wealthy nation that is now one of the most powerful in the world. If this were a fantasy novel, if there were swords and magic flying around all over the place, it would be incredibly obvious that the United States is an evil empire. And yet, we don't seem to recognize it here at home. This is the United States. Now, Trump has backed off on his policy, and people have pointed out that all he's really done is back down from the separation of families, That's just going to allow him to challenge a a settlement reached in the early 90s that requires children to be released from detention after 20 days. In other words, he's seeking to keep these people detained indefinitely, all of them, regardless of why they came here. But the fact is, they all came here for the same reason. The evil empire has been wreaking havoc around the globe, especially in Central and South America. We have been toppling Central American governments, South American governments, setting up fascist dictatorships that then turn around and oppress brutally, violently, murderously, rapaciously, torturously the people in those countries. So it makes sense. The only place where the evil empire doesn't allow that sort of thing to happen is at the heart of the evil empire. We are the capital district in Pan Am. Why wouldn't they come here? It's their only hope to escape U.S.-sponsored violence. Not that it's a hell of a lot better here, depending on the color of your skin. Whether they're coming here for work or coming here to escape murder, it, it amounts to much the same thing. They are desperate to not die. Whether they're being forced into grinding poverty that causes them untold suffering or being actively murdered. They're fleeing here because of our actions. And Trump is just advancing the U.S.'s long-standing fascist agenda. Once again, the only problem with the Trump administration, as far as the Republican power structure is concerned, is that he's being honest about what they've always wanted, about what they've always wanted to do. Once upon a time, the only unforgivable sin in the Republican Party was honesty, but then Trump just blew that out of the water because he honestly doesn't care. 
about what anyone else thinks, what anyone else has to say. So he could say what everyone else was thinking in the Republican Party. No, a Clinton presidency wouldn't have been perfect. It would have been far from perfect. It would have been another right-wing presidency. It would have continued the U.S. imperial agenda. It just would have been slightly kinder about the things we do here at home. That would have been better. We could have fought to make strides instead of just fought to keep concentration camps from being opened more on American soil. That would have been nice. I don't know if Trump has any sort of long-term plans in mind. I think he's just a vicious, hateful, short-sighted criminal thug. But the Republicans certainly are taking advantage of the things he's doing. Moving on to our next story, this one coming from Daily Coast. Republican budget plan to decimate Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security advances in the House. On Tuesday, House Republicans released their budget for 2019, and on Thursday, the House Budget Committee passed it, preparing it to go to the floor. And it will slash, it will absolutely slash, destroy funding for Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and other safety net programs. The closest that the United States ever came to socialism. A very, very limited, very racist very pitiful form of socialism, but nevertheless, it's the best we have. It's all we have. And they want to cut trillions of dollars from it. A trillion from Medicaid, half a trillion from Medicare, uh, five billion from other health care, billions from Social Security. This, if nothing else, is what Trump is good for. Because while he's running around a tornado in a trailer park, they get to be the damage that the tornado is doing mostly to their own constituents. Remember, the Republican Party is made up of, you know, white people, almost exclusively. And the majority of people on Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, are white. We have to be careful come the fall, because in between the election and the swearing-in of the new Congress, they have two months to do god-awful amounts of damage. And it may be that that's how they're planning to get this shit done. I don't know. But maybe if we work hard, we can get this thing killed before uh, the election ushers them out of office. That's my hope, anyway. Moving on. Venezuela's in crisis. Uh, The UN reports that security forces have killed hundreds of people. Uh, in the last few years. This is uh, coming from BBC. Their investigations have been stymied by the fact that uh, UN investigators aren't actually allowed into Venezuela. But they've done interviews online. They've also done interviews there in Geneva. And they find that security forces have been killing protesters, making it look like uh, staged shootouts and so on. The protests are happening because of hyperinflation. I don't know about that. More likely... The protest is just happening because the economy is in complete collapse. People are worried about starving to death. The food shortages are the actual thing. You know, the, this, the, the actual sentence says, Last year, dozens of protesters were killed in clashes during protests against hyperinflation and food shortages. No, I think it was about food shortages. People are aware that hyperinflation means that the economy is, you know, worthless. But it's the food shortages that they're uh, protesting. And, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say the U.S. is partly responsible for this. Partly it is uh, just the system. When Hugo Chavez um, was elected in 1999, the Venezuelan economy collapsed pretty much immediately when capital fled the country. Something like 20%, as I understand, of uh, liquid capital just vanished from Venezuela overnight. A fifth of all the money. In the absence of that liquidity, everything just went to shit. And yet, Chavez kept things going, thanks to Venezuela's large oil reserves. Apparently, his successor, uh, Nicolas Maduro, is less skilled than Chavez. He has basically resorted to authoritarian tactics in order to keep things under control. The reason I say that the U.S. uh, bears responsibility is because, of course, the U.S. is heavily involved in the crisis in Venezuela. Chavez was briefly ousted from power 
uh, back in the day by a U.S. backed military coup. That coup was then reversed, and in that time, you know, the right wing coup happens, capital floods back into the country. Chavez gets back into power, capital flees out of the country. And Chavez's successor, Nicolas Maduro, is less capable than Chavez at keeping the economy going, keeping people, you know, comfortable, keeping things running, in an attempt to maintain stability until, you know, outsiders decide that, okay, this is just the way things are, let's get back in and start doing business. Maybe uh, that will never happen, but uh, looks like Maduro is just not as capable and is resorting to authoritarian tactics. And it seems that... Uh, These security forces, are we talking state police or are we talking the military? Is this an increasingly right-wing government just wearing the, uh, you know, the corpse of Venezuelan socialism? Or is this an actual civil war taking place in the nation? We have uh, large numbers of people being killed in poor districts in Venezuela. I very much doubt that this is a socialist uh, revolution that's going on. Now, what's actually happening, who's on what side, that's more difficult to say. In any event, I don't expect things to get better in Venezuela. Not so long as, especially not so long (laughs) as we have our own fascists to contend with here in the U.S. An African singer named Akon says he wants to build a real-life Wakanda in Senegal. Uh, he w- is planning to build a crypto city. He's already been gifted 2,000 acres by the government near the uh, capital of Senegal. Uh, and he's planning to build it around a crypto currency. He's named it after himself, A-Coin. And he wants it to be, you know, a crypto-based city. <laughs> I, eh, you know what, good good luck with, I have no idea how you're going to do anything there, Akon. But, um... Uh, I don't expect anything good to come of that. Cryptocurrency is not magic. It's not going to solve the problems of an exploitative economic system. You're not going to make a real-life Wakanda because you don't have a monopoly on a magic anything. There's, there's no way that this is going to result in anything. It's just going to be a giant boondoggle. And if anything ever gets constructed there, then I guess it'll move some money around. Congratulations. And in our final story, our final set of stories, is about uh, the complicity of official forces when it comes to oppression. Uh, The first story from BBC, uh, India Police, sorry for lynching photo. It's a uh, photo of somebody who was beaten and murdered by a mob. Uh, You can see in the photo, the individual in question is being dragged by the mob. He's been largely blurred, but you can see them holding him by the uh, wrists and ankles as they uh, carry him somewhere. And there's a trio of police officers leading the mob. The police have apologized, said that the police officers weren't actually trying to... uh, participate in the mob that the 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 rumors that it was a cow protection mob was a lie that it was actually a a road rage incident over a motorcycle accident no india has a a long history of conflict between uh, different castes basically the oppression of the poor it also has a long history of the oppression of women and on top of that you can add uh, conflict between uh, muslims and hindus muslims or sorry Yes, Muslims and Hindus, between Hindus and Buddhists, uh, between Hindus and Tamils. There's lots and lots of class and religious conflict going on in India. And very often you can find Indian police participating, as well as the uh, army. Another story, police kill an unarmed teen. This is from CNN. Uh, Police kill an unarmed teen running from a car that was linked to an earlier shooting. This is a... uh, An incident in Pittsburgh. An unarmed 17-year-old took off when police stopped his vehicle. And he's he's dead now. Will this get any sort of national attention? The police received a report of a car that was involved in a shooting. Fifteen minutes later, they see a similar car and a 17-year-old boy is dead. Black. A black boy. Undoubtedly, I... Black Lives Matter will add his name to the list. 
and they'll agitate for things to happen, and nothing will happen. But one white supremacist has gotten some measure of response. Uh, this one from ProPublica is U.S. Marine to be imprisoned over involvement with hate groups. This is about Lance Corporal uh, Vasilios Pistolis. Uh, he's a member of the U.S. Marine Corps. And he was involved in the violence at Charlottesville. Uh, he's a neo-Nazi, and he actually participated. So he's been convicted and court-martialed on charges of disobeying orders and making false statements. He's going to be imprisoned for a month. He's going to be docked to pay, reduced in rank, and probably fo forced from the Corps. So, hooray for probably being forced out of the Marine Corps. But this is... Uh, this, this court-martial, it's a summary court-martial, it's a, like a misdemeanor trial. They're not treating it as a serious offense. Every branch of the U.S. Uh, military uh, says that, you know, the, the regulations say that you're not allowed to participate in racial extremist group. But they don't do a heck of a lot to uh, enforce that. Recently, a, uh, a graduate of West Point... Uh, was discharged from the U.S. Army uh, for posting a message online saying communism will win and wearing a Che Guevara t-shirt to graduation underneath his official uniform. And looking at the pictures, I, uh, every time I see these cadet uniforms, all I can see is fucking Confederate soldiers. You know, the gray jackets. Whether it's West Point or the Citadel down here in South Carolina. The, the, the communist, the commie cadet, is what they call him here at the Guardian, he was allowed to resign for uh, after a reprimand for conduct on becoming an officer <laughs> because of being a communist. But uh, later, uh, because of his pictures of himself, you know, wearing a chase shirt and so on, was given an other-than-honorable discharge, whereas this Marine will probably, he's being processed for separation. Given that he's been uh, put in prison for a month for participating in racist racist violence at uh, Charlottesville, hopefully he'll get a discharge. It would be nice if they could give uh, some sort of definitive statements there. But all of this is to say that uh, police and military forces have a significant tendency to lean to the right. You hear about uh, military-backed coups, you know, military juntas, dictatorships, things like that, your response, or at least my response, is typically, oh, okay, the U.S. is set up under their right-wing government somewhere. The surprising exception to that is typically Turkey. Kemal Ataturk, when he set up uh, the Turkish state in the last century, he basically gave the army, the military in Turkey, he gave them a special commission saying, I need you to uphold secularism here in Turkey. And they take that uh, fairly seriously. When there's danger of, an, uh, of a Muslim extremist government coming in, then they step in, oust the democratically elected government, and put a secularist in power. So a sort of right-wing secularism that is willing, with U.S. help, to murder millions of people. I'm talking about the massacre of the Kurds there. The... The, the, the Turkish military, slightly different, but not all that great. Not that great. Uh, yes, cops, the military, at all levels, it seems, they have a right-wing bent and participate in the oppression of minorities, the murder of minorities, violence against the bodies of oppressed groups. And that's why when you see uh, anti-fascists or anarchists, they say uh, all cops are bastards, ACAB. Because the the police don't come in with dogs and fire hoses to uh, to to break up shareholders meetings and and, and throw out uh, and to empty the boardroom. Instead, they turn the uh, hoses and dogs and and guns very often on uh, on the union, the striking workers, on the people in the street. So be careful out there if you're uh, flying a lefty flag. It can be. Depending on where you live and the color of your skin, it can be quite a bit dangerous. And in science news, let's wrap this up with something a little bit happier. Electronic skin will enable amputees to perceive pain through prosthetic fingertips. Well, not just pain. 
Okay, I was deliberately going for the creepy there. But engineers at Johns Hopkins have uh, made an electronic skin that is uh, that transmits electronic impulses, sensory stimuli, to the remaining nerves uh, after an amputation. Uh, anything that can restore mobility and restore uh, agency to people who have lost it is a good thing. Absolutely. I just wish we were willing to also devote time to changing our architecture, changing our infrastructure, so that uh, the world is more open and accessible uh, to people in wheelchairs, on crutches, and the like. I mean, it's wonderful that we can discover technology to give and return agency to people. But it would also be nice if we designed our world so that uh, the lack of ability, so that the presence of disability didn't confer such extreme disadvantages in the first place. People often joke about uh, having Braille on drive through ATMs. I mean, the response is, what, you've never heard of a fucking taxi? Without Braille on ATMs, blind people would be limited to going to a bank, having to deal with them only during banking hours. That puts extreme limitations on their ability to maneuver. Putting Braille on ATMs means that suddenly they're able to get cash outside of normal operating hours. Putting Braille on drive through ATMs means that they can take a cab to a different bank. They're not limited in the choice of bank to the one they know they can walk to. It uh, is just tremendously freeing. When we enable people to live their fullest lives in this way, we can really open up the world. Just by challenging our preconceived notions about these things. So it, it is good. It is, I think, excellent to uh, include uh, a sort of artificial skin on these prostheses so that you know people can receive input, receive stimulus, because this will open up the world for them in a rather uh, straightforward way. I just wish we could uh, put that much effort into opening up the world without the need for these uh, expensive, albeit clever, uh, prosthetics. All right, so that'll do it for this week in Social Justice Alchemy. I am your alchemist, John Brockman. Please like, share, subscribe. Remember, I have a YouTube channel and a podcast where I share this, as well as a blog where I post the, uh, the, 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 the dockets for these, as well as the video and the podcast. So if you want to discuss or comment, you can go to my YouTube channel or to my blog, The Social Justice Alchemist. I also participate in another podcast, uh, Dungeons and Debacles, where I and a group of friends are trying to destroy the world by unleashing an ancient evil. Or at least that's how the rest of the world sees us. I think of it as undoing an ancient injustice. So you can find that at DungeonsAndDebaclesPodcast.com. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.